Okay, so we're on the second section of this review of uh, Lady Snowblood, Love Song of Vengeance. And, um, right, I'm going to take you to a bit where Aya, the anarchist wife, actually does something a bit interesting. Um, if it ever gets there. Now, um, you know, she's despairing because her anarchist husband has been brutally tortured and she was forced to witness it and you know she's not going to get him back and oh look she's staring the eye oh bloody hell that is actually quite gruesome that goes on for quite a while yes laser of blood oh yay and oh she's being hacked to death it's really horrible oh my god and yes so, right, okay, so um, the thing is, okay, it's, it's generally quite brutal, to be honest. The only violence, really quite brutal. Um, none of it like comedy, even in the slightest, I'm afraid. So, um, right, now, it seems a bit like she's doing something, you know, relatively cool there. But, um, right, what I don't like about it is that it is actually kind of typical of this sort of unnecessary martyrdom that you see a lot in films, basically, that women do. You know, um, now, I mean, if Yuki, Lady Snowblood, had gone into that situation, she wouldn't, she would have been fine. She would have come out of that situation absolutely fine. She would have, like, slashed everyone to death and, yeah, it would have been fine. But... Aya clearly has no ability to fight or anything at all. I mean, sure, she used what she had, but she would have known if she, when she went into that situation, surely, that she was just going to get hacked to death, basically, or, you know, killed. She was definitely going to get killed. She would have known that. And I kind of feel like it would have been better if she had, you know, not done that, not put herself in that position where she was going to get killed, because... Um, I mean, she didn't manage to kill this police chief. She just blinded him because he came back later. It's the other police chief, not the secret police chief, this one. And, um, yeah, she didn't manage to kill him. But if she'd kind of, you know, maybe tried to hang around a bit, worked with Yuki and the brother, you know, it, the doctor, she might have been able to do something a bit more useful than just go and get herself hacked to death. And... Unfortunately, I feel like this does happen a lot in films, you know, women just go into something where they know it's going to be horrible for them, they know they're going to get horribly injured or they don't mention injuries or something just because they're being martyrish and I hate that, really wish they wouldn't do that. So yes, that's a bit of an issue I kind of feel. Anyway, so now um, the Doctor decides to use the letter to blackmail the uh, secret police chief instead of what the anarchist brotherhood intended which was to you know go and uh, cause a riot hopefully cause a revolution now i'm gonna moan a little bit about yuki here um she basically she keeps going along with men's plans okay to start with she didn't have much choice about being sent to spy on the anarchist brother because, you know, Kukui is obviously an evil bastard and is going to do something terrible to her if she didn't. So, um, that's understandable. And then, you know, okay, so she goes along with the anarchist brother's plan, but it's kind of his letter and his thing that happened to him and his friends. And, you know, she owed him because she had been spying on him. So it was sort of, and she hadn't been there for that long, you know, she was kind of new to the situation. So it's sort of understandable that she went on with, along with that. But when, but the, this point, this doctor, he just decides to blackmail the police chief and the minister instead and sends her off to go and give them that message. And... You know, she just goes along with it. She doesn't question it. She doesn't even seem to think of questioning it. Um, which, I mean, and there are certainly questions to ask about it and whether or not he should be in this really high-handed way making this decision on behalf of all the slum dwellers, you know. 
So, you know, unfortunately, I, I do feel that's a bit unfortunate, really. I would prefer it if she had, you know, maybe tried to discuss that. I mean, I think she had by that point earned the right to have some say in what happened to the letter. So, yeah, I just feel that's quite sad. So now I'm just going to... So here we have the minister in Kikui discussing what to do about it and um, he decides, Kikui decides they're going to just burn the slum down. Fabulous. He's just so evil. It's just like, my God, the more evil things possible he can... And, right, and he's also talking about burning the slum down to eliminate the plague. They put that there because they sent the, after Bruce Lee torturing, torturing the anarchist, he um, was injected with plague and then they put him back and then of course they, uh, oh right, here we have the sewer rats are challenging the system. This is why he won't give in, this is why he burns the slum down. It's about the system being challenged. Oh look, there's the tiger! So, um, yeah, the, this is kind of what people in charge are concerned about, this system being challenged. And they will go to an incredible amount of lengths to do that, like, you know, setting up anarchists, framing them and stuff. So, um, and of course, burning a slum down to eradicate the plague that they put there in the first place. Stuff like that, you know. So um, that's uh, sort of very much fits in with the uh, anarchist narrative, I would say. So it's kind of, uh, I quite like that and any anarchist watching will be like, yeah, yeah, man, that's how it is, man. Anyway, <laughs> so um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the tiger. Now, oh, God's sake, the, I think it's um, talking from a sort of martial arts point of view, Chinese martial arts point of view. I find it very discomforting that this tiger is really used very much to accentuate or symbolise the nastiness of Kikui. Um, now this is a Japanese film, the Fujita Toshiya, the director, he was Korean, and, but it's all, yeah, it's a Japanese film company, blah blah blah, so it's all Japanese except for the director, I think. And um, so maybe they see tigers differently in Japan and in Korea, but in Chinese martial arts, which is my background, Tigers are pretty much revered. Um, they're considered wise and, you know, protective. And while, yes, they are fierce and strong and can rip you to pieces, they're very careful about it. They don't just go around lording it over people because they can, you know. And I kind of... So, for me, this use of the tiger in this context is quite um, grating and discomforting. But I mean, it's a Japanese film, so I guess you just kind of have to live with that one, really. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about anarchist history here. Okay, now, um, anarchists and socialists are different, but there's quite a lot of overlap enough for anarchists and socialists to work together for the greater good on occasions. For example, in the Spanish Revolution in the 1930s or in the May Day protests for workers' rights in the late 1800s. But um, there's this kind of gripe historically that anarchists have about socialists, which is that um, they sell out when the going gets tough and um, they kind of tend to de-radicalise what we're doing to make it you know, more palatable to the bourgeoisie. Now, um, the doctor, he's not a socialist as far as I can tell, I don't know anything about his political leanings at all. What he most seems, mostly seems to care about is what's in front of him. But he is de-radicalising what his anarchist brother wanted and he's very deliberate about that. He's very clear that he doesn't, he wants to use it to blackmail instead of um, start a re revolution because he doesn't like revolutions, he doesn't like the uncertainty, he doesn't like the trouble and he feels that uh, blackmailing is a more certain way of getting something from the, you know, to 
the, the people in charge. So, um, you know, he wants them to provide the slum dwellers with rice and money and stuff like that. And, um, okay, so you sort of think that's a fair enough thing to do in some ways, but the problem is uh, he does it in a really high-handed way. He just makes that decision himself. He, um, he doesn't ask any of the slum dwellers about this, really. Um, I mean, I kind of got the impression that it was a tried and tested method, this blackmailing people with money and power to get stuff like money and food. But um, he didn't like read it out to the slum dwellers or anything like that, give them any kind of chance to think about it for themselves. He just did that, took that decision out of their hands, attempted blackmail, and then the slum got burnt down because, you know, Kikiri would rather burn them all. And um, so it kind of went horribly wrong. And so although he's not a socialist, and, and they wouldn't have even know why either, that's the other thing. They wouldn't have known why they got the plague in the first place. And they wouldn't have known why their slum was burnt down. And they all burnt, you know, most of them did burn to death, basically. And that was because this guy, this doctor, kind of acted in this really high-handed way, basically. And I'm not saying the consequences would have been any better if they decided to try and overthrow the masters using the letter. But, you know, the choice was taken out of those people's hands. And um, that's very satisfying from an anarchist point of view, to be honest with you. They feel like, oh, that stupid doctor, I should have consulted everyone. Look, it's gone horribly wrong. I think that was great. It just feeds in very well to the kind of narrative that anarchists feel that is, you know, how they how they see things and how they see their history. And of course, this is set in the kind of turn of the century, turn of the twentieth century, early nineteen hundreds. So it kind of is about that time anyway, where they they quite often feel like there's problems. So um, anyway, the um, Yuki she goes back to the burned down slum after killing loads of police and she gets that police guy in the other eye before she kills him which is really cool and um finds the doctor in the slum dying from plague with the letter still safe he somehow managed to escape being burned so um the film ends as it began in a graveyard and they go to a graveyard where kikui and the minister are like um are going to mourn their dead or pay their respects to the dead. I don't know if they think of it as mourning in um uh, the Far East. And um they kill Kikui and the minister and all the henchmen and then in the end Yuki kills the doctor because he begs her to kill him because he's dying of plague and he's really horribly injured and she's the last one standing, even though she has actually taken a few bullets, don't know quite how she's managed that, but hey uh, she's the last one, this woman who has basically slashed her way through everyone, really, including the Doctor in the end. So, um, from an anarchist perspective as well, that's actually a pretty good ending. Um, now, um, <laughs> it's so miserable this film, it really is miserable. But, um, now the thing is that uh, anarchists will tend to watch films that about maybe anarchist revolutions or other kinds of revolutions or revolts and stuff like that where, you know, it fails and everybody dies or they're just punished horribly and the masters are still in place and it is just so miserable. But in this one, actually, the bad guys get their just desserts, okay? So the system is still in place, but, you know, the bad guys get their just desserts and this woman is still there to fight another day and maybe overthrow the masters another time. So that's actually a relatively happy ending from an anarchist point of view. And there is a sort of tendency to revel in that underdog status, you know, the constant struggle and failure, <laughs> basically. So, um, yeah, that's uh, pretty good. So I guess from... So from a, both a feminist and an anarchist point of view, this film is pretty good. Um, it kind of, um, but I do obviously have some gripes about Yuki going along with the men too much. Um, there wasn't another film made, so, you know, maybe, you know, 
some guy, somebody out there could uh, make a third Snowblood film where she, you know, does actually make her own decisions instead of just going along with what the men say. But um, anyway, and Aya, okay, she's a bit rubbish, really rubbish. So basically I give the film about eight and a half out of ten just because I, I cut off a point because Aya's rubbish and I'm cutting off another half a point because, you know, she, Yuki should have been a bit more had a bit more agency basically now um this film it was starring the uh, lady snowblad was played by a uh, kg miku and the director was to she no was it fujita toshia and um yeah they for she fujita toshia uh, I'm going to put a lot of the information about this on there. But anyway, um, he made this film as um, when he was working for a film company. He was actually working for the pornographic arm of a film company. Obviously, now this isn't really a pornographic film. There is a bit of a sex scene in it, but it's not very much, to be honest with you. And um, the only this guy seems to be really into Aya's feet. Uh, I'll be honest, I've been with a few anarchists, they're not really necessarily that into feed. I just should blow that stereotype in case it's one in the making. Anyway, um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's not obviously not a porn thing, but he was able to basically to do what he wanted. And I feel like this is a really good example of a film where, you know, it it's not um, bothered by commercial concerns, you know, about selling loads of films or... You know, and it's not um, driven by, you know, what the Chinese government want, which, I mean, unfortunately is the case in a lot of uh, Chinese martial arts films. So I really think that um, it's, it's quite important to remember that I, I feel like, you know, if talented people are allowed to just get on with it, they can do so much better. And um, there's a film Bruce Lee made that I watched recently called Way of the Dragon which I think of it, it's actually made me think Bruce Lee's really brilliant and um, that is Bruce Lee's film, he made it by himself, pretty well not by himself, it was like his film, he was the one who was completely in charge of it. So I think it's a good example of how good films can be if someone talented is in charge and I'll be reviewing that at some point. So, um, and I'll put all the other stuff like um, this woman, she was in Katie Mako, she was in a, another series called Alley Cat Rock, which is apparently ladies on motorbikes, I'm sure you'd love to see that. And then there's another series called Scorpion, which was women in prison, I'm sure that's loads of fun. And um, yeah, there's a whole load of other films that she starred in and that Fujita Toshia directed, and I think they're well worth checking out. I've not seen the first Lady Snowblood film, because I've just not found it in a second-hand DVD shop. Um, but I reckon anything you find starring her or with him directing or in involved in is probably going to be worth a shot.